Hello. Thanks for coming, everyone. Awesome. Yeah, I have a voice again. It's <laughs> so good. Awesome. Hey, I wanted to be here in th uh, VR with all of you, but for whatever reason, I just was having audio problems on my Vive. Real frustrating. So, well, I'm, I'm glad. I, I'm just glad I get to be here. Yeah, and thank you, Matt. Uh, so, uh, Matt's slides are should be loading up. Let me make sure they they're coming up right now. I see, I see them. Does it? Does it oh, does whoops. Them? Yeah, yeah. yeah the, I just reloaded them for some reason. Yeah, they look like they're all good to go. Yeah. So, Matt. Uh, some of you know Matt before. He helped teach our Intro to Unity course. Uh, so we're really happy and appreciative that he came and gave a giving another talk on how he incorporates VR safety in his uh, VR apps. And he's, again, a researcher for Tom Furness, um, grandfather of VR. He's worked on some awesome pro projects with Make-A-Wish Foundation, uh, making VR apps for, for kids in that program. So really excited to see what he, he's going to talk about today. So, yeah, like I said, I'm Matt Matt Cook, or like Nick, Nick said, I'm Matt Cook. I work with uh, the Virtual World Society. Uh, it's a nonprofit founded by Tom Furness, the grandfather of virtual reality. Uh, our goal is to promote VR and AR and just technology in general uh, for good, uh, doing projects that help lift mankind. You know, um, yeah, just going off of the, what uh, Mark was talking about with 360, we actually used a little bit of that in our um, Make-A-Wish project recently, where we had um, our wish kids you know wish day he was going through uh, his you know, his vr wish and it was taking place at the top of the space needle in seattle and because of covid not everyone could go up there so what i did was i took a 360 camera to set it up and videoed the whole thing so that everyone who couldn't attend could you know, be a part of that wish that special wish day yeah the next little add-on application to what mark was talking about but what I'm here to talk to you about is VR safety. Um, I don't know how much you guys know about VR and the risks that are inherent with it, but especially as you're getting started with your development education, particularly those of you who are continuing on to the VR application building class, I feel like this is a really important bit of information and what kind of power you're dealing with as you move forward. So VR is awesome. It is amazingly powerful. You can do unbelievable things, but you do need to approach it with caution. So that's what I'm here to talk to you about. So next slide. Nicholas, oh, there we go. So. If you use VR incorrect, oh, a little bit of formatting problems, whatever. If you use VR wrong, it can do, you know, a few different things to you. It can do, it can give you headaches. It can give you eye strain. Uh, I think we've all seen probably funny videos of people at the mall falling over. Um, honestly, it, those those videos are fun and all, but it is worrying to see that happen because the VR industry is one broken neck lawsuit away from. Um, basically kind of being shut down. Honestly, I can't believe lawsuits haven't, haven't happened yet. We, got, we have to be careful about that sort of stuff. And most importantly, it can make you physically ill if you don't, if you are using it incorrectly. So next slide. So who can tell me why is VR for 13 and up? It's something all the Oculus, Vive, all the VR companies say, you should only use this if you're age 13 and up. Why is that? Can anyone tell me? Raise your hand. All right. Mark J. Oh. Uh, well, I think it's because of IPD. I think a child's uh, interpupillary distance is much too small. And it should immediately, it will immediately give him eye strain. Yeah, good. Yeah, so IPD is definitely an important part of it. You know, they've got the, they've got the smaller heads, so they can't see quite, quite right. 
But from my experience, honestly, they've been able to put on the headset, and I haven't heard much complaining from under 13-year-olds about uh, eye strain. But then again, they may, the, eye strain tends to take time to develop. They're usually not in there for that long a time, so it could, it, so it might be more dangerous. But honestly, a lot of the, a lot of the problem with being uh, putting ki kids in there under 13 is we don't know what the long-term effects are because they've got the small they've got the smaller heads they're getting that eye strain you know if they're exposed to that for longer periods of time especially for hours day in day out it could we, we don't know what those long-term effects are uh, and that also goes for not just ipd but the the way you see in vr is not the same as what we see in real life. Next slide. So this is a very, I'm not going to claim to be an optics expert, but this is a very crude depiction of way we see in real life. So we have different depth planes. Now, I, I don't, I'm not saying like there's three specific ones. This is just a crude representation again. But objects that are up close you see you look at differently have, have you ever noticed you know when you look at cl objects up close and then you look behind at objects behind the ones up behind are blurry and then if you change your focus you're changing your you're physically changing that depth plane that you're focusing on and then suddenly the things off in the distance are uh in are in focus and the things up closer blurry so when you're looking at things at different depth planes, you're, you're focusing on them differently, plus the things up close come in at different angles. You're seeing that light from different directions, but objects that are far away, though the light, that light is all coming from, you get far enough away, it's all based effectively optical infinity. So all the light comes at you at a single direction when it gets far enough. Uh, far enough away. Up close, the co light's coming in from all different directions. And it's hitting your eyes. Your eyes are a sphere, and so it's mapping onto that sphere of your eye. So next slide. In VR, however, everything is at optical infinity. You don't have to worry about depth planes. You don't have to worry about what's up close and what's far away. We use uh, thing. We use cues like. Um, uh, why am I spacing on the word? Um, parallax. Parallax is the word. So parallax, where you view can view things at different angles based on where you're standing, or uh, and size. There there are different three D cues you can use to create depth, but it's all at optical infinity, and it's mapping onto a plane, not your sphere. So. Even though it looks good, it looks realistic, it looks pretty much right, it is not the way we see the world. So if you have young developing brains and developing bodies in, extended in VR for long periods of time, we, we have no idea. Nobody has ever done a longitudinal study on what those impacts are on even, even adults, let alone kids. And if you start doing that it's, it's not just long-term effects too this kind of thing can start causing eye strain so it can start you can start bugging your eyes i mean those ar devices they st they use those depth planes in you know vr doesn't have to worry about that but the ar does because you have to start focus they've tried to put things in your real world and you have to start uh, focus on them appropriately and if you get that wrong in those ar devices uh, like the Magic Leap or the HoloLens, it can be disastrous. I have a friend who has, it's been, what, two years? He was using a Magic Leap for extended time for his work every day, and he is disabled now. He can't, his, his, his eye, he's not blind, but he can't focus on anything. He can only focus on th things at a very specific depth away. He can't we, he can't look at screens. He can't be in lit rooms for very long. He sits in the dark and reads audiobooks all day. He's been going to specialists. He's been seeing doctors. This is an, a, 
this brand new technology the world has never seen before is creating injuries the world has never seen before. And no, people don't know how to treat it yet. So you have to be careful to get these things right. Uh, so next slide. Now, let's shift gears. Let's talk about VR sickness. Who gets VR? Who can tell me who gets VR sick? Like, or emoji, first off, who, emojis. Who, who here is prone to VR sickness? Who, who here has experienced that? A good number of you. Who can tell me what causes it? Raise, or, or, I raised my hand. Who, raise, raise your hands if you can tell me what causes VR sickness. Dragon S. Well, I know for me, one thing that, that well, two things that I really noticed that one is if I, I have a lot of motion that I sense with my, with my eyes, but my body is still like that, that um, sometimes it helps if I just like stand up and like move around a lot because, because then I have at least some sense of motion. But also if I'm in like, like I really start to notice it, like I noticed it after about an hour, but after about an hour and a half to two hours, just whatever the shift of perspective is, I start to feel all wonky. And if I come out, if I've been in VR for more than two hours, I have to lay down. I don't feel good. And people, people say to me, they're like, whoa, you don't look well. <laughs> so I, I try to limit myself. <laughs> um, uh, that's, no, that's, that's exactly right. Thank you, Dragoness. I mean, yeah, that, that uh, what you're talking about, the word for that is called locomotion. And so when you're seeing, the, you, you know, when you use your touchpad or something and you're your character or your player uh, in game is being subjected to motion that you are not physically doing. Uh, so some people say, you know, they just every lots of people know about VR sickness, but they just chalk it up to some people. Some people get it. Some people don't. It's just the way it is. And that there's nothing you can do about it. And that's just not true. In fact, I talked to I talked to a um, a guy who uh, at a at an event once he was giving VR demos and he was uh, showing off a game that uh, included locomotion, and I tried to talk to him about this and he's just his he, his attitude was yeah just some people get VR sickness some people don't you know, nothing nothing I can do about that and nothing nothing to be done whatever, and I I found that really disturbing that someone whose job it is to subject people who have never experienced VR to that to to that and just not understand or not care. But anyway, uh, next slide. So what causes motion sickness is the same thing, VR sickness is the same thing that causes seasickness, it's the same thing that causes car sickness, it's caused by a disconnect. So in your inner ear is your vestibular system. Now don't worry if you can't read all the little words i'm not you are not subjected to a uh, biology pop quiz later but your inner ear is how you get your you know orientation it's your inner it's your body's gyroscope it's your body's accelerometer it's how you detect motion and how you're oriented in relative to gravity so what happens is if you start seeing motion that your body does not feel your brain will start to believe it's been physically poisoned and it'll start to make you physically ill. It'll start to make you nox nauseous, trying to get you to throw up the poisons. Now, some people are more subje subject to that than others. Um, me, I, I don't get VR sickness. I'm, I'm, basically, I'm basically immune to it. I can, if things are like really bad, I can feel a little like, oh, this feels wrong, but I'm not going to get sick. Other people are extremely prone, and just the slightest thing will set them off. And you know, it's the same thing in the picture you see in the car. You know, when you're in a car, you're if you're moving like on the freeway and you're at a constant velocity, you're not feeling any forces on you, but you're still everything on the car looks still relative to you. But you start seeing motion whoosh by, and it starts to it can start to make you feel sick. The next slide.
Yeah. And so there are safe ways and unsafe ways to deal with this. And oh, and it's not just before I move on. It's not just locomotion either. That is one of the primary ways, but it can also be a matter of frame rate. So if you have the wrong, so with VR, the standard is 90 frames per second. Uh, the, you want it as high as you can get it. But if you drop, if your frame rate stops, starts dropping too low, suddenly everything starts seem, feeling laggy. And if you're feeling of lag, you're moving your head, but the image is not following you closely enough. And that will really start to get people. So even if you've designed your game appropriately and you're playing good content, if your computer is not able to process it well enough, if your game has not been optimized well enough, it can still be dangerous. So in, up here we have two columns, the unsafe and the safe. So the top picture in the unsafe, this person, he looks like he's skiing, but he's actually do. I, I stole that image, uh, it's, he's Naruto running. So he's putting his arms back and he's doing all sorts of ninja runs and, and super cool. But his body is still in the same place. He's not going anywhere. So he's seeing all sorts of crazy motion. And that is really dangerous. Now, um, what Dragon S would mentioned was if she moved or got up and moved around, it kind of limited that. And that definitely that definitely helps. There are definitely ways, people, uh, strategies people have come up with for mitigating that effect. So if you get up and move around, you do start feeling some motion. So that can help a little bit. So you can still see, you can see that with this VR treadmill. So that if your body is experiencing some motion, that helps. But that's not to say your body is feeling the right motion or all of the motion. So it can still be dangerous. Another thing people do that's common, and Altspace here does it if you start using locomotion, is it will close in your field of vision. So it'll introduce like this black sphere around you, so you only have a, a smaller field that you can see. It's the same. So if you would decrease that field of view, it will not have the same effect. It's the same reason, you know, if you you, you don't get sick watching an action movie. Uh, in, a, in a theater, because you still have your peripherals establishing your base. You, your body doesn't feel like it's moving. It's looking at something else that's moving. So that can still help. But it only helps so much. You, it's still, you, you still need to approach with caution. But, if you, but there are ways of improving. Really the main truly safe way to do mo to explore world in VR is with teleportation which you can see there on the right. So when you teleport, you've just established a point, your screen blinks, and then suddenly you're in another position. No motion, no, no uh, apparent forces on you, you're just blinking and you're there. It, it, sh it should be completely safe. Uh, this game uh, is an example from um, one of my favorite VR games, um, Budget Cuts. I think, I think that one was really clever, how they took that Load that teleportation mechanic, and they, you know, introduce some sci-fi technology into the game to naturally introduce that, because that's something a lot of people, they, they don't like introducing teleportation because they feel like it breaks immersion. So they took, they took that, and they found a way to naturally incorporate it. So I thought that was very clever VR design. Anyway, a little bit of a tangent there. Next slide. So the worst thing you can do is roller coasters. It's high speed, constant, constant moving, constant forces. Oh, they're just awful. Don't do VR roller coasters. Do not put your friends in VR roller coasters. Just no. The what? I hate so much when I see go to the mall. Who who who? Emojis if you've seen those stand at the mall where you just have those those uh. Six degree of freedom seats with the roller coasters and just people walk in, they can put in on a roller coaster simulator. I hate those things. Because you know who's doing those? People who have never done VR. They have never experienced this before. So not only is it making these people sick, what they're going to do is they're gonna put on the headset, they're gonna feel queasy, and they're going to walk away thinking VR 
makes me sick. VR makes people sick. And it's just not true. It's the experience that makes people sick. And those people are going to walk away and they're not going to want to try VR again. And they're not they're going to tell people who have never tried VR not to do it because it makes it will make them sick. It's really counterproductive to the industry. And it's just a shame that those people like, VR is amazing. You're all here. You know how, how powerful and cool it is. And those people just aren't going to be able to experience that properly because they've got this poor notion in their head. Anyway, next slide. Now, there's more than, that's what I, what I want to say about physical safety, but there's more to it than that. I want to talk more now about emotional safety and, respon and your responsibility as game developers. VR is amazingly powerful. It can link minds and bring people together. It can put, put you in another shoes and allow you to connect emotionally to others and create empathy. It can allow you to overcome fear and create courage. It can unlock your, unlock your mind and your memory. The, your options are, limit, options are limitless. It can literally cure pain. Uh, who here has heard of, well, most of you have you've heard of Snow World. No one? No, Snow World is cool. It's just quick tangent. What they did was, so burn victims in the hospitals, you know, when they're getting their wounds treated, it is unbelievably painful. You can't shoot them with enough morphine to get through, to stop that pain. So what they were, so what they would do is they'd put people in VR and they'd be in this cold snowy environment where they're you know snowmen running around and you can have snowball fights with them and they're penguins and what happens though is when they've got this snow world on they don't feel their treatment they no medication necessary you have to be aware of your pain to feel it and so it's a non it's a non-medicative pain treatment so it's just amazingly powerful what you can do when you're immer truly immersed um, but there's a flip side to that coin next slide everything that makes VR powerful everything that makes VR cool like any power it can be used for bad it can be when it, it can instead of helping with fear it can create it instead of creating knowledge it can create misinformation it can instead of love it can spread hate so you don't it's the same as anything on the internet you can have a, a re, the regular internet you can have you know inf, information but you can also spread in misinformation and people can use it poorly to be negative and hurt the world and same goes for vr except that added level of immersion makes it so much worse because you can connect to it emotionally so much better now so far i haven't seen many experiences that you know you know neo-nazi vr games that scream white power or uh um in, in global warming is fake educational games so 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 far that hasn't been so much of a problem but really gets what really has been more of a problem for damaging the psyche is extreme violence in the games. So next slide. Games are getting higher quality. I mean, these are these are not VR games, but these are just you know regular system games. But they are getting unbelievably beautiful. The standard is rising for what they can and should look like and how realistic they are. And the industry demands it because people won't buy anything that isn't this good and this realistic and detailed. But along with, it's not just the environment that's doing that. Next slide. It's also the violence. The games are getting bloodier. They're getting more. They're getting more violent. They're getting more detailed in that violence. I won't linger on this slide. Next slide. Let's take 
Grand Theft Auto is just an example. I love Grand Theft Auto. It's so much fun. My mom, my mom hates it though. She, she never let us have it in the house as a kid. Every time she found a disc, she just immediately destroyed. We had to hide it. She felt it was too violent. She felt it spread bad messages and uh, was a bad, was a bad influence. And quite frankly, I felt and still feel. Yeah, she's she's crazy. I mean, I I dis I disagree. Um, I don't. I Grand Theft Auto has never hurt. The different our world, and then there's their world. There is a fifth between you, separating them. If they uh, uh. <laughs> audio cut out a little bit. Oh, can, ever, can everyone, most of you can hear me. I dropped out for a second there. Yep, you're good. All right. All right, All right what was I saying? Um, so that physical, that, that separation between our worlds is gone. And you're able to, when you're immersed, it really feels like you're there. And you're able to connect, again, emotionally with those characters. Now, what does it so what does it tell you when you feel like you're there you see this person in front of you and you it's easy to forget that they're not real because you can i mean i can't tell you how many times i've you know i've been at a virtual desk and tried to put my controllers down on it because you for it doesn't seem to matter how fake the world is how cartoony your your mind is able to believe it's as real as it needs it to be if you're if you're properly immersed so if you're in that state and you're pulling it you're you're holding a gun and you're pointing at people and you're pulling the trigger and you're seeing that blood and you're seeing them die that is just horrifying now i'm not going to claim that killing a person in vr is going to mess you up psychologically the same way as killing a person in real life that would be a completely ridiculous claim we all know that's just not true but when you start doing practicing that every day and you start you know making a habit of doing of killing just over and over again with repeat you know, repeatedly training that and repeatedly training that there are no consequences to this how can that not eventually do something to your psyche? It, it, I, I don't believe it. I don't believe it can. It, it, it will start to impact you, and it can either make you give you nightmares or it can make you numb. So, next slide. Now, I'm not here to villainize games. I like. I love. Game. I, I love video games, um, especially especially in VR. Um, yeah, everyone's gonna have to draw their own line. Uh, like Space Pirate Trainer. Who's played Space Pirate Trainer? A, f a few people. So you've got your little space guns, uh, la laser blasters, uh, kind of like in Guardians of the Galaxy, um, and you're shooting at uh, flying spherical robots. Now there's violent this amount of violence there's gun shooting and action and personally I don't feel much there's much danger in that you know shooting shooting robots with space age weapons I personally don't I, I don't think that's going to be ter terribly damaging to the psyche you individually you may disagree what I what I find what I take issue with you personally may not um, I said, I mean, like I said, I work for the grandfather of virtual reality. I can tell you his bar for violence is much higher or lower or higher. I don't, he doesn't, he likes it a lot less than I do. These are other games like uh, the lab the art, with the archery. You know, you're taking a bow and you're shooting at it humanoids. But, you know, they're just these little cartoony things. I don't know. Um, you're going to have to draw your own line. I'm not going to, I'm not here to tell you violence is awful and you it should be avoided at all costs. You're, I'm just here to say it's. You have to approach with caution. Next slide. 
So to summarize, again, I'm not again, I'm not here to tell you avoid this stuff, it's the devil. You just have to be careful. So you have to be careful when choosing your content, not just for yourself, but it goes back to what I was saying with people at the mall. You have to be careful when choosing things for others, especially. When you who I'm sure you've all gotten your cool VR headset and tried to show it off to your family and friends. Like, look at this amazing thing. Look at this cool experience. Look at this cool thing I made. Put it on the headset. Try it out. You have to be mindful about what you're showing them because it does have effects. You have to be when, especially as you are creating your own VR experiences. You have to be mindful of your users and design it for their safety, both physically and mentally. Um, and <clears throat> VR is not trivial. Again, you'll, have, you'll draw your own lines about what you like or what you don't like. There are some games where I look at it and I decide, I know this isn't very good, but you know what? It's right on that edge. I, could, I can make excuses for it. It's fun enough that I'm gonna do it anyway. That, that's for my use. You can uh, draw your own lines, but just all I really need you to understand from this talk is that it is not trivial. There are there are consequences, and it is not meaningless in the same way you might get in like a 2D video game where you can separate yourself because you can connect to this so powerfully. Anyway, that's it for me. Do we have any questions? Zeke, do you have a question? Yes, I do actually have a question. One, I did uh, read an article about why the 13 and under, it was, um, and I don't know where the article is, it, Yen, it was um, people younger than 13, their eyes are still developing, and they don't know the impact of that. So my question is, uh, is uh, in teleportation, what would be a bad case scenario of a teleportation that could cause motion sickness as well as the locomotion. Because I was in VR chat and I tried the teleportation there and I just couldn't stand it and I had to go to locomotion to make it easier on me. So is there a bad or a good teleportation that can also cause that VR sickness? Um, well, I've seen three different overall different types of teleportation. That's a good question, Zig. Uh, one is, you know, a blink teleport, where you teleport, your screen goes black for like half a second or um, like 0.6 seconds or something like that, and then it flashes back and you're in a new stop. Another is instantaneous, so your screen doesn't go black. You just instantaneously move locations. Now, that might be... Technically, you're not experiencing, experiencing any motion, but if that were the case, if you're in that case, um, it, it, the sudden change in location, uh, honestly, you might be able to make an argument for instant, for infinite acceleration. I don't know if that, I don't think that would be accurate, but it might just be disorienting to just suddenly just blink one frame later, everything in your view is immediately changed. So I, I could imagine that could be more dangerous. The third is uh, dash teleport. So you'll teleport and it'll dash you really fast to that new spot. So in that case, you are getting, technically, even though you're using teleportation mechanic to choose a new location, you are getting that acceleration, you are getting that motion, um, and it's happening very quickly. That could be, that could be, you know, even though it's technically, you know, quote unquote teleportation, it could be the worst case scenario. Or at least, well, I don't know, the worst case scenario, you're not getting, you know, constant is change, shifting back and forth. I feel like bad locomotion could be worse, but still, the dash teleport is not ideal. Hmm. All right. 
Thank you, because I used the instant on Alt Space. You're welcome. Alright, um, just Rob. Oh, yeah. Um, you touched upon it briefly with, with people having their first experience in these silly mall uh, uh, coaster kiosks. But I think there's also a bit of a Pavlovian component. Folks who try it a couple of times and insist that they're always getting spec. Uh, the best advice I ever got when I first, first, first got into VR was to never let yourself feel sick. The instant you think you're the littlest bit off, stop, take a break, stay out twice as long as you were in, and recover. And I found that I built up VR legs very quickly um, to the point where, like you, you know, about the only thing that will set me off is flying a loop in something like Ultra Wings. Uh, is there any advice for folks, uh, uh, you know, trying to coax people back into it uh, to get them to take that second chance? Um, I'm not sure I have any real good advice. You're absolutely right. Uh, that is very good advice for everyone. If you start feeling sick, or if you're sharing this with people, and you need, you should advise them. If they start feeling sick, take it off immediately. Uh, I've done work in the middle schools, and that's one of the number one rules I tell them. If you start feeling sick, take it off. I've definitely had experience uh, trying to coax people back into VR when they're scared of it. Uh, they feel like it's going to be sick. And I honestly, I haven't had a ton of success. You know, they just, they just like, nah, I don't want to. No, no thanks, never mind. And I'll try, I'll, I'll try to encourage them. I'll... Uh, but I have to draw. Uh, you have to figure out how to draw that line between encouragement and pushiness, and trying to force it on them. Because you don't want to do that either. So it can it can be a little bit tricky. But honestly, it's very difficult to get them back into VR. I guess all you can do. The best thing I can say is try to be encouraging, be positive, let it go if they don't want to do it, and try to get them like start them off with something really innocent. Something that will run smoothly, that'll be really cool and attract their attention, and that won't require any motion. Now, is they, you know, things that we are walking around your space, like you're seeing motion as you walk around physically in your play area, but you're feeling all that motion. So should, that should be okay, just as long as there's no actual need for translation. You know, with locomotion or teleportation, just get start them off with something real easy that doesn't require ev anything. Everything that you need to possibly reach or touch is right there within reach. All right. Let's see. Karen, do you have a question? Yeah, Matt, I was just wondering if there are people that cannot ever put a VR headset on. Um, I have a brother, and uh, he comes from, you know, the gaming world. I mean, he had one of those gaming boxes, and so he's real familiar with all, all that. But about a year ago, when I started off, I had a Go before I got my Quest. So about a year ago, he put the Go on, and as soon as he put it on, I think, I can't remember what comes up first, like the logo or whatever it is. Nothing had really even come up. He had to take it off immediately. He couldn't, it, it just he, it just kind of blew him out of the water. And then he also, like if he goes to a, um, an amusement park or something and there's a 3D ride, he has to close his eyes. So uh, he just can't take it. So I'm just wondering... You know, are there people that, I mean, is that something you could eventually get used to, or are there people that just will never be able to wear it? Um, he might be able to get used to it. I don't know. I haven't done the research on this. But um, one of the things I said at the beginning of the presentation is the way you see, the way the images are displayed in VR is not the same as what you get in real life. So I suppose mm -hmm. I have heard of people that are so extreme to uh, those artifacts that they'll get sick no matter what. Um, so everything coming in at optical infinity and noticing any frame rate at all. I mean, uh, I just go I just Googled it on my phone while you were talking, but the Go has a maximum frame rate of 60, you know, 30 to 60 frames per second, 
whereas the Vive or the Oculus Go at 90. So just the Go is going to be inherently much worse. Mm -hmm. 60 on the Vive is not ideal. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I suppose in some extreme cases, maybe I, was compl maybe I wasn't 100% ac accurate in saying VR doesn't make people sick, it's motion. In some cases, I suppose it would be you know, VR inherently and just inherently the way it displays information being different from reality. Um, that would be my guess. But mm -hmm. then again, I haven't, I'm, not, I'm not an optics expert. I haven't exactly done you know, an in-depth research on why exactly those people might be, but that would be my guess. Okay, thanks, Matt. You're welcome. Dragon S. Um, yeah, I just wanted to comment on what Karen said. So, um, that I found that um, something that seems to affect people too is people who tend towards claustrophobia um, and people who really don't like being enclosed. That that when they're in that VR space, they they just they go into claustrophobic mode and they really get hyper stress about it. Um, I'm actually working on a setup that has it's like a like a peek in. So um, it's something I started using when I'm doing development. But so you actually aren't this part on your face isn't there. So you just have your you put your eyes up to it so that you have the divider, but you don't have the sides. So you're still in your room. You can still see your room. But it's like you're looking into a 3D picture, um, and and um, that's not really VR immersion. But like as far as like showing showing people worlds that you make and stuff, like I don't know, I've had good luck with that. Um, and and uh, I've actually been working on a prototype that I've got that's like just like a handheld VR, so that you you're not. You don't have to be so fully immersed and having the thing strapped on your head for people who don't like that. I don't know. Interesting. That's all. Yeah, that's, uh, mm. that's actually, uh, I guess that makes sense why people with claustrophobia might not like that. Because, you know, even though you're virtually in an open space, there is something, you know, physically clo you know, closed in on you. And you're vi it's very close to your eyes and your face. Um, that's not something I'd actually thought about before. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so how different? Let me ask you a question. How, how how does that handheld VR compare to like the um, a phone-based system like the cardboard that doesn't you know and you, know, you just hold your phone up I, to your face? Uh, I I'm actually using a, a cardboard on it right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so so it's so no the the app is cardboard, but it's it's uh yeah so it's got the lenses, but it doesn't have the box. So I guess. I guess if you just took a regular cardboard and and just used the the lens interface from it, I don't know. I haven't seen the actual cardboard unit, but I use the cardboard app. Um, okay. Yeah, like, as long as you get the lens, but I in also there, it use it be able for to see it, view it. Yeah. 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 Uh, so you know, it's it's just something I've been playing with recently. So That's I'm still, awesome. Thanks. Still in work. <laughs> Oh, that's great to hear. Thank you for sharing. Yay. All right, Ultra Sloth, did you have a question? Yeah, do you have any other examples of how VR has helped treat patients like the burn victims? Um, well, I've done some work with... Uh, or I, I know of a company called Virtual Therapeutics that uses VR for medical applications. Um, it's just really good for you know, treating chronic or acute pain. Because if you're able to distract people, actually, I do have a, I do have a story. I, I get most of my stories from my from uh, Tom Furness. He's he's done he he did all the original uh, research on this back in the day. He invented virtual reality back. Uh, you know, 54, 55 years ago, working for the Air Force, developing fighter jet cockpits. So, uh, and then he took the, then he took it out of the military and brought it into industry and academia with uh, the Human Interface Technology Lab at the University of Washington. So, all that old original research 
church with was was him. So. But um, he was having you know there were kids getting their uh, treatments like their shots or you know I can't remember what they were exactly they were getting treated for, but um, they'd get their treatments and they'd just scream and scream in agony. It was awful. So what they did what they did was they had a you know an early VR headset. They put it on, and so I think this early one was called like the uh, Virtual Vision Sport or something like that. One of the one of the first um, uh, consumer available consumer ready VR headsets. So what it would do is take a TV screen, you know, one meter by two meters or something like that, and it would just display that in front of you, and you could watch TV like on the beach or something. Um, so they hooked that up to like a video game system, and kids were you know just playing video games just in VR. You know, like with the with the joystick, you know, the um, PlayStation or console, whatever console existed back then, console controller in their hands, and they're just completely distracted. And uh, you know, normally they'd be screaming when they got their treatment. Then they'd get their treatment and they would just go like, ugh, and then just keep going, just oh, pretty much unaware that it even happened. <laughs> Dentists were, were using it um, for that virtual vision when they uh, were having kids come in. And so what was happening is, you know, normally the dentist is an awful uh, place, but they put the, they allow the kids to wear those in the chair and they're just completely happy and cooperative. And just for the first time ever, kids are not dreading the dentist. They're asking their parents, when can I go back to the dentist to try this thing out again? Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, are there no more questions? Awesome. All right. Can everyone hear me? Emojis? All right, yeah. Everyone give some emojis for Matt. I want to thank Matt for coming, giving a talk. Uh, this is actually very interesting, and I, I fell in the boat of someone who first came in here and felt a lot of discomfort in VR, but eventually grew into it. Uh, so I definitely... Especially the analogies you use, like uh, the feeling when you're in a car and get car sick because there's motion going on outside the car but not in the car. Uh, it's a great comparison to what VR is like when you're having movement but are not actually moving. So, awesome presentation. Uh, we'll have the recording posted after so you can always review and go over the presentation if you like. Uh, but thank you so much, Matt, for coming and, and talking to the students. You're welcome. I'm happy to share. Awesome, guys. All right, so uh, we are going to just hang out from now on. You don't have to stay if you can't, uh, but we're just going to go into a world that Mark made, uh, having some more uh, hemispheres and uh, photospheres. So the teleporters are in the back. Uh, we'll go into one of the worlds, and we'll just hang out from there. So thank you, guys, and I will post a recording on the Discord after.